morning, everyone, and welcome to our church service today. God knows us better than we know ourselves. God calls us, inviting us on a journey of love. In the shadows of the night, God calls us. Here I am, for you called me. In the daylight, God calls us. Here I am, for you called me. God calls each of us by name. Here I am, for you called me. Let us pray. Loving God, you know us better than we know ourselves. Our prayers are in your heart even before they are on our lips. And yet, we must utter our prayers. We must proclaim our praise for you and all your wondrous creation. Your love surrounds us, and you have promised to be with us always. You know our heart's desires to serve you. We pray that you will keep us true to that desire. And so we order our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture lesson today is from John 1st, verses 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel asked him, How did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathaniel replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe me because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things. And he said to him, Very truly I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Dear Pastor Irene, thank you so much for your continued prayers and mentorship throughout all of these years. I first met you when I was a student at Northwestern University and also a member of Second Baptist Church when Dr. Heisel B. Taylor was pastor. I remember your beautiful smile and your warm hugs and generous uh, care that you had for me. And I just wanted to share this one little piece for you.
May God continue to bless and keep you as you let your light shine. Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship on this day. Um, it is uh, indeed a, a great day, and we give thanks and praise to God. I do want to take a few minutes to just thank those persons behind the scenes that help to make our worship service uh, a blessing. Uh, and for those who are participating in today's service, I want to thank Selvi uh, Puswami, who does all of our um, video and everything for us, editing of the videos. So we're very grateful for her and for uh, Kim, uh, who gets out the um, notices about worship service. And also, um, today I'm um, grateful for Linda Elliott, who uh, served as our liturgist. And also, uh, I'm very grateful for uh, my good friend, Marcia Porter, um, for allowing us to um, uh, use her voice today uh, to lift us up and to inspire us through song. Uh, so indeed, we are grateful to God. We have a lot to do today. My sermon is um, somewhat lengthy, and so I want to get right into it because of uh, the time that's uh, allocated on the video. I want to preach on the topic um, love the power of redemption um, but I'm also using a backup title um, that I like to use is called uh, which is calls for such a time as this our message today is somewhat different from um, our text for today um, but I've tried to combine it with um, the current events that are going on uh, in our country and also with um, the reality that we're in epiphany. Um, so I want to add to the scripture lesson that was um, that you heard uh, earlier from uh, Linda, which was from the Gospel of John. Uh, I want to lift up a passage of scripture from um, John's letter, 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And it reads, we have known and have believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who remain in love remain in God. And God remains in them. This is how love has been perfected in us. So that we can have confidence on the judgment day. Because we are exactly the same as God is in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. And then I do want to lift up because this is um, Epiphany, the season of Epiphany. I do want to lift up um, John, um, one verse from our gospel lesson um, read earlier from John chapter 1, and that's verse 49. And I want to pick up this amazing statement that Nathaniel um, makes as he responds to um, Jesus calling him uh, and recognizing him. And to this, Nathaniel replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the Son of God. Knowing who God is and recognizing God uh, is critical for all of those who will follow him. Nathaniel's words in our text say to us that God's love is revealed to us in Jesus. This awareness is, is indeed an epiphany. That moment in our lives when we declare our love and loyalty to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ is indeed a moment when we are experiencing that great epiphany of who Christ is. Today's text from the Gospel and the Epistle of John both states that love is central to the Gospel. Today, as the light of Christ is made known to us through the witness of Nathaniel, 
I want to couple his statement with that light as the representation of the manifestation of God's love for all people. Today is also January 17th, the day that many, uh, uh, many remember the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., warrior of love and justice for all. Given the present day turmoil of our country, we need to remind ourselves of who we are as disciples of Jesus Christ. The whole of scripture is about love, righteousness, and justice for all. There can be no salvation or redemption without love. It was for the sake of love that God wrapped God's self in human flesh and came and dwelt among us. Prior to the words of Jesus in 1 John, Jesus spoke to his disciples about retaliation. Jesus said to them, let me challenge your old way of thinking about your enemy. In the past you were taught an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strike you on the right cheek, turn the other also. This teaching was radical and went against everything tradition taught. To them, it was not realistic. It simply went against human nature and the order of life in any social system. The human mind, when frightened, quickly moves to a state of fright or flight. The way, this way of thinking always leads to winners and losers. The human mind, left to its own devices, will seldom seek win-win situations. We are a power-driven society that thrives off of haves and the have-nots of society. Martin Luther King Jr. in a sermon at Dexter, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church on November 17, made this observation about humanity. Dr. King wrote, history unfortunately leaves some people oppressed and some people oppressors. And there are three ways that individuals who are oppressed can deal with their oppression. One of them is to rise up against the oppressors with physical violence and corroding hatred. But oh, this isn't the way. For the danger and the weakness of this method is futility. Violence creates many more social problems than it solves." End of quote. To counter the concept of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth mentality, Jesus moves to the subject of love. His teaching on love is, uh, his teaching on love is uh, just as radical and turns the concept of uh, uh, re, the concept of retaliation upside down. Jesus reverses the order of life as the disciples knew it. Jesus teaches a theology of turning the other cheek. What does this mean for us? It challenges us to love our enemies, to show compassion towards those who hurt or harm us. That doesn't make sense. But that's what Jesus requires of, 
of us. Jesus tells us that loving those who love us is no big deal. Anybody can do that. The challenge for his disciples is to love those that hate and despise them. Why does Jesus lay this burden upon his disciples and upon us? Well, it just might be that Jesus understood that if his followers are to transform the world, their values had to be different. They could not look or act like those of the world. If they were to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, Jesus' disciples had to be something distinct. There had to be something distinctively different about his disciples. Love is more than practicing an act of kindness. Love is transformative and redemptive. Yes, acts of kindness can bring about change, but anybody can do a good deed. And good deeds can be done for selfish reasons and for selfish gain. But love gets at something deeper. Love changes the giver and the receiver. Love alters the heart and the mind of both. Hatred and love are two totally different concepts whose end result is profoundly different. Hatred seeks to destroy and to diminish another. Love seeks to build up and to edify. Hate is life threatening and love is life giving. In contrast to hate, love is centered in what is right for all of humanity. Because of the chaos in our country today, I am rereading Seeing Gray in a World of Black and White Thoughts on Religion, Morality, and Politics by Adam Hamilton. In this book, Adam addresses the wedge that has been created between so-called conservatives and liberals, especially in the body of Christ. Hamilton writes, our desire for certainty, our need to be right, and our tendency to miss the mark have conspired to keep Christians from experiencing unity and instead have led to endless divisions within the Christian faith. End of quote. Hamilton raises the question of how can we, as Christians, transform the world when we cannot find a loving way to live together as God's beloved. We must own the reality that the church is often a place that wound and hurt each other, a place that preaches love, but we live it out in a very limited way. We live it out in such a limited way that it includes some and excludes others. When hurt, when we are hurt, we seek retaliation through very unloving and revengeful acts. This weakens our ability to be the light of Christ to all people. The problem lies in the fact that we try to love others out of our own selfish and limited love. We mean well, but we have not come to grip with the fact that our love is not endless or unconditional. But God calls us to a higher form of love. 
God wants us to love each other the way God loves us unconditionally. We can only love this way when Christ is first in our lives and has priority in our lives. When we fully experience the love of God in our personal lives, then we can extend that love to others. Love is centered, you see, in forgiveness and grace. When we realize that God continues to love us in spite of us, then loving others become a lot easier. This is what grace is. Grace helps us to love the one that persecute us, the ones that hate us. Love, unconditional love, grace helps us to continue to walk in love. Love helps us to understand their weakness and to remember that God can transform all lives. Love keeps us faithful. It will not let us give up on the power of God to transform our world. My sisters and brothers, I don't like racism and are racist people, and racist people make me angry. But they cannot turn my heart into a heart of stone because my heart belongs to God. I will challenge them with every breath of my life. I will stand in opposition to all of their hateful and misguided beliefs and teachings. But I will not hate them because I have dwelling deep within me too much of God's amazing love for me. Because God looks beyond my faults, because God keeps forgiving me over and over and he forgives each one of us, we must learn the power that exists in love and forgiveness. When we can see our faults and failures as we see others, then our lives can be transformed into new creations by the power of the Holy Spirit, freeing us to extend love freely to others. As we struggle with the various social justice issues in our world, many turn to hate because we have not allowed or heeded the teachings of Jesus. When we experience the light of Christ in our lives, it radically changes our hearts. That ultimately changes our thinking. We move from what we want to what God requires of us. We fear standing for righteousness and justice for all means losing our earthly gains, and we may. But nothing in this world compares to a life centered in the righteousness of Christ. When we cease to think of others as our enemy or those people, but see them as sisters and brothers and trust the love of Christ to do transformative work in all of us, then we can love as Christ demands. One is not an enemy until we make them an enemy. When we are hurt and wounded by someone, if we start to pray for them and ask God to help us find a way to see good in them, then it is hard for them to become an enemy. There may be persons who dislike or hate me and see me as their enemy, but I don't have to see them as an enemy. In fact, God compels me to love them. God's love is far greater than our emotions and feelings. Emotions and feelings will keep us in trouble 
all the time. Scripture tells us we're not doing any great thing when we love our friends and those who love us. When, when we are really being, being all that Christ requires of us is when we love our enemies in spite of what they do to us. Love is radical. Love, love has a way of transforming folks. On November 17, 1957, Dr. King, in his sermon, Love Thy Enemy, stated, Jesus was very serious when he gave this command. He wasn't playing. He realized that it's hard to love your enemies. He realized that it's difficult to love those persons who seek to defeat you. He realized that it was painfully hard, pressingly hard, but he wasn't playing. This is a basic philosophy of all that we hear coming from the lips of our master. Because Jesus wasn't playing, Jesus was serious. We have the Christian and moral responsibility to seek to discover the meaning of these words and to discover how we can live out this command and why we should live by this command. Dr. King reminds us that hate distorts the personality of the hater. We must remember what we see and what we receive from those who practice hate is a distortion of who they are. Sin is a distortion and hatred is sinful. Let us remember that God has compassion for those who are lost in sin. To have compassion is to love someone in spite of his or her sinful nature. With God, sin can be overcome. Scripture reminds us that we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us so that we may be children of our Father in heaven. For he made his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. As we struggle to learn to love those who define themselves as our enemies, let us remember that love is redemptive and transformative. I still believe today, as I did when I was a teenager in high school, that love is the answer to many of our society's ills. If our hearts can be changed, our minds can be transformed. God has been in the business of softening hearts for centuries. And God is still able to take a heart of stone and turn it into clay so that it can be reshaped and reformed into a heart of compassion and love. God's grace is not limited to only the just and the righteous, but to the unjust as well. That's what we must remember. It's not limited to just those of us who seek to follow God and to live up to the, the standards God has set before us. But God is about redeeming those who are lost, those who are still walking in darkness. And that is our call. Does not mean that we will not get angry, or that the injustice and the unrighteousness that we see in life, that it does not impact us and hurt us. But we must not let our anger 
our righteous anger calls us to sin. There is a difference between just being angry and standing in righteous anger. When something is wrong, we ought to be angry, but we ought to stand in righteous anger because it is in uh, through righteous anger that we're able to transform the world, but by the power of God's love that dwells inside of us. Let me close on this morning with, again with the words of Dr. King, who reminds us, love your enemies. Because if you hate your enemies, you have no way to redeem or transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, you will discover that at the very root of love is the power of redemption. May we see Jesus this morning as we close out the service. It is my hope that we may see Jesus as Nathaniel did and declare, Lord, you are the Son of God. You are the light of God that dwells with us. May we declare and make up our minds that we will be followers of Jesus Christ. That we will not let our hurt, our pain, and our sorrow cause us to sin. Instead, we will use it as few to do the work, the hard and difficult work that Christ has called us to do. As disciples of Jesus Christ, let us hold on to our love. Let us not allow anger to fill our hearts. Let's walk with love in our hearts. Let's stand for justice and righteousness with love in our heart. And now, as Jesus will call us to be faithful. We are called to pray for one another. And so on this day, uh, I invite you to join me in our pastoral prayer. Almighty God, we have been through a difficult week. We have seen things that many of us never imagined living to see. And yet we have witnessed it. We have witnessed a kind of hate, oh God, that Sometimes we would want to give up and just quit and we want to become like the enemy, but we know that if we become like them, there's nothing to be gained. And so God, renew in us a new spirit and a new attitude. Help us, oh God, to cling to love. Help us to be faithful, God, to the call to be your disciples. And Lord, as we celebrate the season of Epiphany, prepare our hearts and our minds to see you in new ways, to experience your love in new ways, that we may not live out of distorted personalities because, God, we are looking at the world through lens that are unholy and unrighteous. And so, God, we pray for our nation. We pray for this country, we pray for all of your people everywhere, God, that you would soften hearts and that you would transform spirits. But God, we must be willing to allow you to do that. And God, as we pray for our nation, we pray for our community. We ask, oh God, that you would bless the people of joyful spirit, that you would provide all the needs, oh God, that you would comfort the brokenhearted, those who are sick, God, that you would be a healer for them. Those who, God, are uh, feeling distressed because so much is going on, that, God, you would speak peace to their hearts and their minds. God, help us to be the light of Christ in the world. Help us, oh God, uh, to continue to let that light shine because, God, it has the power to renew us and to renew others and to transform lives. And so, God, we thank you for uh, being a, a God that is faithful, a God that is loving. And now, God, keep us and watch over us. And now, God, as you taught your disciples to pray, 
We pray today, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We want to invite you to continue to uh, support the ministry of your church. Um, we ask that you would pray about uh, your giving and pray about the needs of the church. Um, but we thank you for the gifts that you uh, give. And at this time, as we stand on faith, we want to bless those gifts that they might be used for the building of God's kingdom. God, we hear your call and we answer. Bring in all that we have and all that we are. Use our gifts, our talents, and our bodies for your work, for peace and justice here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Jesus, Hope of the Nation. Jesus, Hope of the Nation Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source. Of heaven's light on earth In history you lived and died You broke the chains You rose to life You are the hope living in us You are the rock in you we trust
indeed need that hope in our lives today. I pray that as you um, leave this service today, that you would cling to love. Don't become discouraged. Don't let the things that are going on in the world distort who you are. Walk in the light because the light dwells with us now. The light is present, shining in our lives, in and through us, that we might lead others to stand in that same love. At this time, let us receive the benediction. My sisters and brothers, go into God's world, aware of God's call in your life. Follow our Lord Jesus Christ, who will lead you in paths of service and hope. Lean on the power of the Holy Spirit to give you courage and strength. May peace, joy, and hope flow through you to others. In God's name we pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. God bless you and God keep you. Thank you.